I'm Chris Carter. This is the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. And today we're going to talk about one mini camp is over for the Steelers. They're on their break before training camp uh, begins in late July. But also, we talked to defensive coordinator Terrell Austin, and he talked specifically about some things he was he would change about how the team was conducted last year on defense versus how he plans to use them this year. Also, George Pickens saying he's going to line up in the slot. What he and new receivers coach Zach Azani have talked about what this this unit needs to do do more. And of course, we're also talking about Pittsburgh Pirates. It's Chris Carter with Brian Batko and Andrew Destin at the Pittsburgh. For Post Gazette. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive Podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Brian Backdoor, one of our great Steelers beat writers. And as always, you can find the show on your favorite podcasting apps every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube, like this video if you enjoy it, subscribe to this channel to get all of our episodes, as well as the daily content that comes out from all of our Pittsburgh sports writers at here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And as always, this show is brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's Beer Bar, they're right across the street from PNC Park on Federal Street. There were 500 different available beers, 300 of those beers are from the local pittsburgh area and 80 of those local beers are available on tap more on them later brian mini camp is done that means we we you know we get to we don't get to see the steelers again for a few months but i we've been we, one of the things we've been uh, tasking or i guess trying to nail down when we go there is how this team's going to look different from last year how can they can take a step up and when we talked to terrell austin he seemed to task himself with needing to put Mika Fitzpatrick in better, in better places. And part of that was also using the personnel that, they, that they've added. In the, well, Omar Khan has added in, in the offseason. What was your takeaway from how Terrell Austin kind of acknowledged the, some of the problems from last year and how he's going to try to do things differently this year? Yeah, I mean, I think he uh, probably when he reviewed everything, saw a lot of the same stuff that those of us on the outside were seeing. You, know, you, you try to figure out why a player is – savvy and as as athletically talented and gifted as Minka Fitzpatrick didn't make much of an impact and in fact the defense or at least the team was less successful when he was out there than when he was that that should never happen um and it, it probably speaks to you know the allocation of, of roles in the secondary and maybe why they were a little bit out of whack that that could lend itself to the reason for the, the defense actually you know playing better and, and winning more when, when he was sidelined, but we all know he's, he's an asset to this team when he's healthy and he's one of the best safeties in the league when he's healthy. So, yeah, I mean, he was, uh, Terrell Austin was up against it a little bit last year once Keanu Neal went down and it's like, all right, DeMonte Casey, he's one of your best 11. He's one of your best two safeties, but you know, he's somebody who's at his size, he kind of needs to play. Uh, back deep and and then you've got to figure out something else to do with Minka and it instead of getting him around the ball more it kind of took him out of the game more and thought it was interesting that Austin said he that some of those deep completions by opposing teams were balls thrown that uh if, if Minka Fitzpatrick were back there bigger body uh you know more of a uh instinctual player then then those balls probably don't even get thrown let alone completed so that was a puzzle last year that I don't think they necessarily had the pieces in the right place and you know, maybe uh, Terrell Austin did, didn't even have the right pieces to work with. So they tried to change that this offseason, bringing in Deshaun Elliott, much more of a traditional, you know, strong safety, hard hitter coming up in the box, covering tight ends man to man. Whereas Minka should be allowed to go back to patrolling center field, if you will. And that that could elevate this defense to, you know, the top five unit that I thought they could have been and should have been last year that, you know, obviously wasn't. Uh, you know, wasn't really in their grasp due to injuries and, and some other factors outside of their control. Uh, yeah, that, I think it's a big part of this is, you know, if in, if the injuries that happened last year happened to this year's team, they may be better suited for it, but it will hamper what they're trying to do right now with reconstructing things. And, you know, you, you talked about the addition of Patrick Queen, the drafting of Peyton Wilson, the addition of Dante Jackson, the signing of Cameron Sutton and the signing of Deshaun Elliott, all those things. And we've talked about this before on the show, but all those things are things that kind of re relay into what Minka Fitzpatrick did away from being the 
the ranging free safety guy last year uh, because he played in the slot. He played dimebacker. He played linebacker. He played outside corner even at times. And it was to try and help in all these different places. The Steelers had obvious holes they needed to fill. And now if these signings and draft picks work out, maybe they've filled these holes or at least made these holes less of a liability uh, so that Mika Fitzpatrick can get back to what he, he does best. And, uh, and also like, I, I think even beyond the liability standpoint, but also on the standpoint of, I, I think that some of these players could actually be pretty good at their, at their jobs, especially like a guy like Patrick queen and a guy like Sean Elliott. I think that they are significant upgrades from what the Steelers had at those positions. And those are two areas that work in the middle part of the defense that can, if they handle their positions well, that, that, you know, Minka Fitzpatrick gets freed up a lot more and that can make the Steelers defense be elite. And they finished sixth in scoring last year, despite all the things that they went through. Uh, but certainly they had plenty of struggles that throughout the year that they had to kind of correct. And that's why I think it's going to be really interesting for Terrell Austin with the additions that he's made. What else do we see that's different from this, from the Steelers defense um, as this, when we get to see them and uh, start playing in September? Yeah, I mean, one thing I learned at, at OTAs and minicamp was just the the rapport that Patrick Queen and Deshaun Elliott have. I mean, I know I knew they knew each other. They'd played together in Baltimore, um, I think, three years ago, Queen's first two years with the Ravens. But I didn't realize those two were that close. Um, Elliott said a big reason why he even wanted to sign here was once he saw Patrick Queen was coming here, he wanted to play with his friend again. So they, they'll have that kind of, you know, easy, seamless chemistry uh, in the middle of the defense, you know, passing, passing guys off, you know, being able to communicate probably with a look even more than needing to say any words. They hang out together a lot away from the field. Uh, they, they enjoy each other's company. They enjoy chirping each other and being competitive in these practice settings when they need to be. So we know that Minka is not really the most vocal guy. I think he's, you know, whether on the field or off the field, I think it's a lot of just, Hey, uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm doing my own thing. I'm taking my notes, uh, studying, sharpening my mental game. And, you know, he, he plays that way as well. You know, I'll be back here in, in the deep post. Come try me if you want. I'll, I'll have your back if you're a defender in front of me and I'll pick off a pass if it gets over your head. Whereas Elliot and Queen can kind of, uh, you know, take, take care of some of that middle of the field stuff. Uh, obviously, track down ball carriers, get off of blocks and Let's not write off uh, Elandon Roberts either. And he's a holdover from last season, of course. But, you know, if anything got better uh, with age and his uh, tw age 29 season turned in more than 100 tackles for the second straight year and made the Steelers look pretty smart for signing him in free agency after the Dolphins let him walk. Absolutely. And I think that there's a, there's still a lot of things that are, that need to happen for this defense. And he talked about, you know, some of the younger players that he feels like, you know, could be different this year. You know, he talked about, you know, they might use Joey Porter Jr. to follow number one receiver, but they might not because of just match matchup situations. He talked about how DeMarvin Leal looks a lot better, or at least more in shape and more in tune uh, with what the team needs from him in, in, in these OTAs and mini camp than he did last year. Uh, and granted, I don't mean nothing until the pads go on and we got to see if he does anything. But, but, but Terrell Austin doesn't usually have hesitate to sort of right. shoot, you, shoot you straight if somebody's not uh, looking good or not doing what they're supposed to be doing. He will let us know. If right. He's like, so, that I guy mean, needs hey. a bit more work. Yeah. So take so take that uh, for, for what it's worth. And, and maybe he will be singing a different tune once because he, he did preface it all by saying, look, it's football and shorts. I'm not really taking much away from this or, or fully evaluating guys till we get to the trove and see what they can do with the pads on. Maybe he'll be singing a different tune or, uh, you know, being a little bit more realistic about players and, and their opportunities come August. But yeah, at least for right now, uh, glowing reviews of, of just about everybody uh, he was asked to talk uh, to, to speak on on Wednesday. We're going to have a lot more time over the next month or so before training camp to get into the depth of this defense. And I think there's a lot of angles to cover here, but I want to switch to the, to the offense in the next segment because George Pickens spoke this week and he talked about playing in the slot. And I want to talk about what that might look like and how Zach Azani's talked about uh, him and the other receivers he's been, he's been working with, with the Steelers. We'll do that next here on the North shore drive podcast for the Pittsburgh post Gazette, Chris Carter, Brian Backo. But first I want to remind you that the North shore drive podcast is brought to you by Mike's beer bar, the best bar in Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's beer bar, 
You can go there on the North Shore of Pittsburgh. You can sit outside or you can sit inside, but you sit outside, you can see the wonderful skyline of, 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 of downtown Pittsburgh. You can be right across the street from PNC Park. But when you're in there, you're seeing they have over 20 televisions. You can catch whatever sporting event that, you, that, that you're missing out on somewhere else. You can also enjoy one of their 500 different available beers. 300 of those local beers are, those beers are from the local Pittsburgh area, and 80 of those local beers are available on tap at all times. And, and they're always switching new ones in and out, so you're always getting new, getting new experiences every time you go to Mike's Beer Bar. And they also have amazing food like Steak on a Stone where you get your choice cut of steak brought to you on a heated stone. You cut a piece off, you press it into the stone, and you choose how well done you want every single bite of your steak. It's the best bar of Pittsburgh. Go to Mike's Beer Bar today, and when you get there, tell them Chris sent you. We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Batko. Brian, um, George Pickens spoke this this past week, and he talked about working more in the slot as a, as a receiver this season, and that drew some interesting eyes because I felt like, if anything, this, all the other receivers around him in the depth chart are guys that are suited for the slot, whether it's Roman Wilson or Calvin Austin or Scotty Miller. These are all smaller guys that are quicker and more typical for the slot role in an offense. And so, Brian, when you when you heard that, did, did, did you kind of wonder, like, well, wait a minute, who's going to play on the outside if George is in the slot? Um, I mean, a little bit, but I do think that, you know, even going back to, to last season and in the year before uh, with the Pickens-Austin draft class and – you know, what they were trying to do with those two, uh, the previous offensive regime. I mean, I think they want all these receivers to be interchangeable. And I think you're seeing that across the NFL as well. Um, you know, it's good to have defined roles for sure, but that also makes it a little bit easier on the defense when they always know who's going to be lining up where. So, you know, that was always kind of an odd thing to me with Deontay Johnson. I mean, he he really prided himself on being a true X receiver. And yes, he, he thrived in that spot getting open. Um, but he never really offered as much versatility as I thought somebody with his skill set could. Maybe we'll see that now more with George Pickens. I mean, to hear him the other day, you'd have thought he'd never played a, a snap in the slot in his life uh, the last couple of years. But, you know, I think the percentages were like 13% as a rookie and 16% last year. Still not a lot, but you know, give uh, Matt Canada slash Eddie Faulkner slash Mike Sullivan some credit for for working him in there occasionally. And he had some big plays out of there in 2023. I will specifically remember the uh, the one on Mike Hilton down in Cincinnati where they got him matched up uh, with the former Steelers nickel corner and, and Pickens burned him uh, on just kind of a simple slot fade down the field. So, I mean, it's, it's a good uh, club to have in his bag. I, I wasn't really sure if he was looking to do more of that. I, I wouldn't have been shocked either if he said, no, just kind of like the Minka Fitzpatrick thing. Like, no, just keep me on the outside. I'll win there one-on-one, -on -one, and that's where I'm best able to, to help the team. But, uh, you know, I guess I'll, I'll give George some credit for being willing to move around. And, you know, selfishly, I'm sure, yeah, he he wants to get the, the safeties on him and the occasional even linebacker on him because he knows he can simply outrun those guys and, uh, and make them look silly. Now it'll be – I think Matt Canada, you know, he stressed trying to get mismatches too. Uh, he wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, wasn't an idiot. I mean, he, he tried, but I think like everything <laughs> it, as an offensive coordinator and play caller it boils down to like, do you have the right feel for when to do that? Do you have the sense of how the game is unfolding? Are you a step ahead of the opposing defensive play caller? And I, you know, I think the proof's in the pudding now that oftentimes he wasn't enough. So maybe Arthur Smith, uh, we'll be better equipped to do that, whether it's with Pickens, whether it's with scheming things up for Calvin Austin, who I think had a really good spring. Zach Azani, the new receivers coach, did not temper his praise whatsoever for Austin. And, and we witnessed it, observed and saw it as well. Chris being there pretty much every day. It looks like he's he's ready to take another step in, in year three, really kind of year two for him. So I think depending on the formation, um, you know, Arthur Smith, I, I think, will use a lot of pre-snap motion as well that seems like something that's on his to-do list here in 2024 um you want to use it with purpose though not just for the sake of of doing it but um you'll see pickens maybe lined up inside occasionally then let's say you've got van jefferson on as one outside receiver calvin austin as the other maybe he can just run a go and, and clear things out forcing a corner maybe even a safety two 
to keep up with him and Pat Fryer, if you, you have to account for him as well, because he's been really active and really looked good uh, this spring coming off somewhat of another injury plagued season for him. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's all, there are encouraging signs there for the Steelers offense, even if, you know, on paper, the personnel looks like it still might be lacking one playmaker. I tell Mark Conn and company believe the, the hole can be greater than the sum of its parts, at least to the extent that they're not going to overpay for another wide receiver, uh, you know, at, at this stage of the game, at least. I, I want to get back to, you know, Zach Azani, the new Steelers wide receivers coach. By the way, you can see a lot of the clips of our interviews and scrums with the Steelers players and coaches on our YouTube page. Uh, if you're, so if you're watching this on YouTube, just click on our, on our, on our YouTube page itself. And you can see all the different. And, and, and in fact, we got a, a really nice long cause discussion with Zach Azani uh, about several of the Steelers receivers. And, you know, he had a lot of praise. He said one George Pickens is, is adapting to a lot of the little detail things he's challenging him in, in, in these, in these practices. And that's a good thing. But he said that Calvin Austin, he, the, the, the way he said, he said, Calvin's been here. He's, he's here now. And, and, you know, if you're listening, I just put my hands a lot higher. Uh, so, um, but he said, Calvin Austin's been taking serious steps forward. Roman Wilson, who that, that, that interview is also up on our YouTube page. He said that Calvin Austin has been kind of like leading by the, the, in the effort department, as far as the wide receivers, uh, Roman Wilson, the rookie, you know, I think admittedly, he's like, he's like, Hey, like I'm here in, I'm hearing Zach Azani in my sleep right now because Zach is a very hands-on guy. But I also think that that style of coaching is kind of what this group may need, Brian. Like this is this is a young receiving group for the most part. At least the top three guys that you're that you're hoping to develop in Pickens, Austin, and and Wilson. You know, these are all guys that they haven't like Pickens is known in the NFL, but he hasn't made his real footprint yet, I think, of what he wants to be in the NFL. Austin's still figuring out how he fits in the NFL, and Wilson's a rookie. And I think it's it might be really refreshing and good for the for these receivers to have a guy that gets up in their face and like when you watch him at practice, he's slamming his he's slamming his feet, his, his hands and feet on the ground to try to say, I need your feet at this pace. I need you to do this at this time. And that kind of challenge might pull more out of the these these rookies and get them suited for the game a bit faster. Yeah, I mean, the previous two wide receivers coaches here, Frisman Jackson and, and Ike Hilliard, you know, they they brought their own strengths to the table, that in-helmet experience. They both played in mm-hmm. the NFL. Ike Hilliard, obviously a very good professional wide receiver, but I, I don't know if there was as much hard coaching. I don't know if they were quite as hands-on with these guys, and, and maybe they didn't have to be with some of the, the talent and the vets that they had in the room at the time. But yeah, I mean, sure seems like with the Steelers hiring of, of Zach Azani, it was to change the culture a little bit with that group and, you know, Roman Wilson, there's, there's going to be some growing pains, obviously off the bat, didn't expect him to, to come in right away and and make a seamless transition, even as a, uh, as a third round pick who was pretty accomplished in in college last year with the national champs at Michigan, they aren't taking it easy on him. You know, they aren't taking it on easy on, on Pickens either. I don't think based on Azani saying, Hey, everything's right there for him. You know, all the talent, in the world. He just needs to go grab it essentially. So, I mean, you, you do want to see that work ethic improve from year to year. Somebody like Calvin Austin, I mean, we know he works his tail off, you know, his rookie year, just, he went down, he got hurt. Uh, there, there wasn't a lot that he could do. Uh, and last year, I think he tried what he could do to position himself to, to be better, but other than a glimpse here and there, such as in Vegas, uh, didn't really all materialize for him. And what was a disjointed dysfunctional season, for the offense until the final month or so. Um, but yeah, I mean, encouraging signs from him, you know, guys like Van Jefferson, Quez Watkins, Scotty Miller, you know, I think you, you you'll throw the ball out there at, at Latrobe and see who kind of separates himself from the pack. But yeah, I mean, there, there's really a delineated uh, sense of, of who is, is what in that group with Pickens being the top dog and Austin kind of being, you know, in that second fiddle, area Roman Wilson fighting for everything he gets and then the veterans uh you know getting that chance to stand out and you just hope somebody separates through training camp in the preseason with their performance absolutely I think there's still a lot to to, to look at what this, these receivers could be and like you you talked about earlier I think that, that the uh the the question as far as which was if they're going to get a receiver and which receiver they'd want to get in a trade in the trade market 
uh, kind of gets answered by how these guys show up in training camp and, and how they feel that they are. Because if you feel like you might have a number two, you might not need to trade. If you feel like you have a number three with a you know, or two number threes and feel like oh, you need a guy, maybe you feel like you don't need to get as serious wide receiver. Or maybe you feel like none of the guys behind George Pickens are, are ready to really contribute. And so then you do got to go get a really big name wide receiver in the NFL. But all that is stuff I think that they're going to end up trying to work out more so uh, in a month and a half when they show up in Latrobe. Yeah, I mean, even a couple or, or, or a few um, sort of NFL journeymen, if you will, like Denzel Mims and Des Fitzpatrick and Marquez Calloway. I mean, they've made plays at this level and, and they're capable of making plays. So they'll, they'll be kind of like the sleepers when we get to training camp next month. But yeah, I mean, this group doesn't necessarily lack depth. It's just a matter of how much star power is there at the top enough to kind of keep the heat off of George Pickens from opposing defenses. I don't know. I mean, we always hear the Steelers discuss how talented he is. Other teams are going to know that as well. So, uh, and they know they can probably get under his skin if, if they're taking the ball away from him. So it's, it's going to be a team effort, obviously from everybody there. We know that's still going to be a run first mentality. Anyway, Mm -hmm. players talking about trying to be the most physical offense in the NFL sure Pittsburgh is not the only city where they're talking about that in the locker room and in meetings, but uh, they've, you know, they've maybe got the pieces in place now to do that and the identity to try to do that. Uh, the, the coaching from the top down with Mike Tomlin and, and Arthur Smith instilling that in them, all they've invested in the O-line, arguably the best running back tandem in the league. So mm-hmm. maybe the passing game is kind of a, uh, you know, on the back burner to begin with, but certainly you're going to need to, to keep defenses honest and, you know, you're going to need to have that, uh, that component to your, to your offense, no matter what. Absolutely. He's Brian Batko of the Pittsburgh post Gazette. One of our great Steelers beat writers, Brian, thanks so much for joining us. We got to switch topics. We come back. We are going to talk with Andrew Destin about the Destiny's Pittsburgh child. Pod. Destin, yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's his nickname. But Andrew Destin covered the Pirates throughout their road trip. I uh, wanted to talk to him on what he's seen with the Pirates. We'll do that all here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. But first, I'll remind you, the show is also sponsored by Moon Township Honda, which you can find on 5802 University Boulevard and moonhonda.com. Here's our message from our sponsors at Moon Township Honda. To build the Honda CRV hybrid, we took everything you love about the CRV and kicked it up a notch with greater power for a CRV unlike any before. Adventure confidently with Honda, Car and Driver's most awarded brand in 10 best history, the CRV and CRV Hybrid, part of the Honda line of rugged vehicles. Visit your local Honda dealer where new vehicles are arriving daily. Buy online or reserve from select Honda dealers. We're back here in the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We now switch to the Pittsburgh Pirates, and that's covered by Andrew Destin, one of our great Pirates beat reporters here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And Andrew just got done with with, with being in St. Louis, and now the Pirates, after losing two out of three in St. Louis, they... One and one of those came with a not so great start from Mitch Keller, as far as you know, and after an after an outing that he uh uncharacteristically did, didn't perform well in. And I wanted to ask you, Andrew and Mitch Keller, you know, as much people as much as people are excited about Paul Skeens and Jared Jones and the young guys, Mitch Keller has been an ace for the Pirates this year, he has been fantastic. Did you see? Uh, what happened in his start against the Cardinals as more of a bump in the road, or maybe it was there, a, was there anything that worried you there about the, about how things could continue for him this season? No, not too much. I mean, for me, I first off just think that it was a bump in the road. Um, it, it, give up four runs in six innings. Obviously that's not great, but a couple of points to make there first, he still covered six innings, which when he doesn't have his best stuff, that shows you what he's still able to do for this staff is that he can go deep in pretty much any game, just given His repertoire, his build, his ability to go deep with the pitch count because he's been built up for a few years. So he still did what was kind of essential and required of him. Um, So that's first thing. The second is really this start could have been a lot different if he just makes two better pitchers. Um, Both the home runs were on cutters, and the cutter isn't his best pitch, but neither of them were particularly bad pitches. One was a 3-2 cutter that caught a little bit too much of the plate. And the one that Nolan Gorman hit, uh, Mitch Keller said afterward that he actually felt was one of the better cutters he threw on the day. So... 
not remotely worried about it. Um, it was more an aberration than anything. It was something to write about and certainly something to monitor because um, it was so weird to see that. Um, I think Mitch Keller's ERA over his previous six starts was 1.13. He had been excellent starting with that complete game, uh, you know, one run ball against the Angels back on May 6th. So he had been pitching so well. I don't look at this as anything to concern about too, too much. And to your point, Chris, um, he's been arguably their best pitcher all season. And that's no disservice mm. to Paul Skeens or to Jared Jones. It's just he's done it, start in, start out. When he hasn't been great, it hasn't been a spiral of a performance. Like he hasn't had one that's truly been an ugly eight runs, three innings that the guy can't get out of the fourth inning and you have to pull him early. Like even when he doesn't have his best stuff, he can pitch to soft contact. Yeah, he's going to give up a good number of hits. But it's just a matter of him being smart with his pitch count and recognizing, hey, like I got to get deep in this game for the team, given the status of the bullpen, or just frankly, because he knows that's his responsibility as a starting pitcher. Um, and I think we're just seeing that, that this was not his best, but certainly far from his worst. Yeah, and it also it wasn't like he got obliterated in this game. He just did, didn't shut it com- completely down. Uh, the Cardinals ended up winning four to three. It did cut off a six game win streak of whenever he took the mound, the Pirates had been winning. Uh, dating back to uh, early early May, uh, but looking at that, and you know the Pirates dropped the series against the Cardinals. They're now back down into last place of the NL Central. But as you and I have been talking about, that kind of is very relative to just the fact that the NL Central is all kind of ho- outside of the Brewers who are way ahead in the division. Everyone's kind of hovering around themselves. Like even the Cardinals who just beat the Pirates in the series, they're still a game below 500. The Pirates are four games below 500 and they're still they're still just a game and a half back of, you know, of, of the of the Cardinals themselves. And then there's the wild card chase where they're a game and a half back cuz the Cardinals themselves are right up there with the Giants as far as teams uh, you know, vying to be, be, be wildcard teams. So I, I think it's interesting to see, again, just the fact that everything is really, you know, kind of huddled up on, on, on itself uh, as far as as far as this. But do you think, you know, when you look, look, look at this, is there any other signs of any other teams that you think maybe could fall out of contention and make this a little bit less of a thick pack in, in, very soon? No, I mean, it's tough to say. And I think this the Cardinals Pirates series I'm going to use as like the perfect data point because it just showed how, you know, and this is no disservice to either team, how perfectly mediocre both those teams are and how perfectly mediocre most of those teams jumbled up there are. It's not like this is, you know, the AFC North, to use a football analogy, where it's, you know, all the teams are pegged as some of the best in the league and they're all beating up on each other or, you know, like the the Big Ten East or something like that. This is a matter of all these teams have their flaws, have their warts, and I think that just means that they're going to be trading blows, trading punches. I mean, look at it this way. The Pirates in three games against the St. Louis Cardinals scored seven runs. Um, The Cardinals starting pitching is fine. It's good. Sonny Gray had a good pitching at performance, and Lance Lynn did what Lance Lynn has done this year, which is cover, you know, four-plus innings and give up maybe a run or two runs or something and then get pulled. Um, like the Pirates just couldn't do much of anything against the bullpen. And Miles Michaelis nearly, you know, threw a perfect game against them, having seven, seven innings of one hit ball. So I bring up that data point and I bring up this series to say that the St. Louis Cardinals are very top heavy and not deep. The Pittsburgh Pirates, in a lot of ways, are very top heavy and not terribly deep because it's all about the starting pitching, a couple of position players, and a solid back end of your bullpen. The way that these teams are structured, I think the only way that we see anybody fall out of contention is a very serious injury, and I'm not wishing that on anybody, but that's how a team falls out is, let's say, you know, any one of these NL West teams, like if the if the Giants pitching staff, they lose two more guys to the IL, like a Blake Snell continues having the injury plague deer and Logan Webb gets injured, then yeah, that might be the, the kiss of death for the Giants. And I think that kind of rationale applies to all these teams, so... I think it's too early to say that anybody's falling out of contention or anybody's a prime candidate for it. I think the reality is just that none of these teams are particularly deep. The margin for error is that thin, and it means as they play each other, they're all just going to beat up on each other. The the Pirates have their upcoming series on the road against the Colorado Rockies before returning home to face the Reds and the the Rays. The Reds and the Rays kind of hovering right around the same kind of record as the Pirates, sub sub 500, but not too far below, both in the wild card chase in their their own leagues. But 
the Rockies are one of the worst teams in baseball right right now as far as as far as their record. Is, is this a series you feel like this, the Pirates have to sweep if they're going to try to make you know, make any moves here to stay stay in the hunt or get get back ahead of the pack when the in the wild card chase and also make it clear to management to be like, "Hey, like this team is it can be a team that 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 does win out in this race if if you just invest in it at the trade deadline." Hey, you got to win at least two. Yeah, you can't drop you can't drop two out of three to the Rockies and have it be a two and four road trip. Like that can't happen. Um, the sweep would be nice. It's probably asking a lot. Um, and it's probably asking a lot given how the starting rotation is gonna look this series. Um, looks like it's gonna be a bullpen day today, tonight against the Rockies, Jared Jones on Saturday, and might be a bullpen game, or they call up, say, Dalton Jeffries from Triple A Indianapolis to make a spot start with Paul Skeens getting pushed back to Monday. So the way that I look at it is, yeah, I mean, yeah, in theory, it's the Rockies. They're not good. Their bullpen is the worst in baseball. Their starting rotation is not particularly good. But the Pirates aren't going to be putting out their their best threat in terms of the starting rotation, um, save Jared Jones, who gives them obviously a great chance whenever he takes them out on Saturday. So, um, yeah, this is an important series. It's the Rockies. They're not good. They're the worst team in the National League, arguably. It's them fighting against the Marlins. That being said, um, this isn't the perfect way that it's set up for the Pirates. Their offense, their bats are going to need to come alive, and maybe this is a get-me-right series, but we'll I'll just have to wait and see. Well, you can read all about it at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us here on the North Shore Drive podcast. And uh, you can read all his work at post-gazette.com as well as all, all of our work at post-gazette.com. And you can also hear and watch him with Noah Hiles, our other great uh, Pirates beat reporter with him as they have video and audio content on our podcasting channels, just like we have video and audio contact here for the Post- Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and our sports department. Uh, thanks again for tuning into the North Shore Drive po- podcast. And thanks for Ryan Batko for also joining us. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. Read my work here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, post gazettecom And remember to subscribe to this channel to get all the Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive podcast, as well as all the daily content we produce here. We'll see you here again here Monday here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all the sports coverage from the Post-Gazette that we have to offer, visit post-gazette.com.